Tractate Beta, page 38b. Top of the page. With the words Haresh in this Arev Lo Kav Chitin, Basara Kavin Chitin Shachavero, etc. If one single Kav of wheat became mingled with ten Kav of another's wheat, shall the latter eat all eleven Kav and rejoice? One does not allow his property to become nullified into someone else's property. The same applies to water and salt. In dough. The sages laughed at him. He said to them, Did I take your cloaks from you? That you are putting me to shame? They again laughed at him. Rabbi Oshaya said, They did well to laugh at him. They were correct that the two cases are dissimilar as they reason as follows. What is different about a case of wheat belonging to one person that became mingled with barley of another? That Rabbi Abba did not say this case to them as an example. He specifically chose an example of wheat mingling with other wheat and not that case of barley because that is one type mingled with something that is not its same type. The principle is a type of food mixed with a large amount of food not of its own type becomes nullified. And this principle applies even when the two foods belong to two different people. If so, the same may be said when wheat of one individual is mixed with wheat of another as well. Although, according to Rabbi Yehuda, an item mingled with another item of the same type is not nullified. According to the rabbis, it is certainly nullified. Rav Safra said to Rabbi Oshaya, Moses, this is a term of reverence for the leader of a generation. Have you, in fact, spoken well in defending those who scoffed at Rabbi Ava? But did those sages who scoffed not hear of this teaching that Rabbi Chia of Ketasva's Rabbi Chia Ketosafa Ketosfa Rav Chia of Ketosva in the name of Rav. One who removes pebbles from another's wheat granary is obligated to reimburse him for the loss he has caused and pay him the value of wheat according to the weight of those stones. The latter could have sold those pebbles along with the wheat as there is always some refuse mixed in with the wheat that is weighed and sold along with it. Therefore, the removal of the pebbles has caused the owner of the granary a monetary loss. Apparently, he must compensate him because he has reduced his measure of wheat. Despite the fact that the pebbles themselves are worthless, we do not say that the pebbles were nullified in the wheat, and that consequently, there is no loss involved in their removal. Here too, in the case of one who borrows water and salt, which are not worthless, all the more so, we may say that one has reduced his, his measure and he must compensate the lender. It cannot be said that they are nullified in the dough 
and that they are no longer taken into account regarding the Shabbat limit. Abai objected to the comparison to the case with the pebbles and the wheat and said to Safra, and does the master not differentiate between money that has claimants, such as in the case of the pebbles removed from the granary in which the owner seeks compensation and therefore there is no nullification, and money that does not have claimants, as in the case of water and salt, where the owner lent them to the borrower and does not demand them back for now. In the latter case, it is possible for these ingredients to be considered nullified. But if Safra said to him, and according to your reasoning, that one may distinguish between money that has claimants and money that does not, how would you account for this teaching? Rechiz has said, according to Yehuda, who maintains that an item can be nullified only when mixed with an item of a different type, but not the same type. Flesh of an unslaughtered animal, carcass, can be nullified in a larger quantity of meat <coughs> of, a, of, a unslaughtered, of, a, of a slaughtered animal. Although carcass meat generally imparts impurity, if someone touches the mixture of the two meats, he does not become ritually impure as the carcass meat considered a different type from the slaughtered animal and is therefore nullified. This is because meat from a slaughtered animal cannot attain the status of carcass and therefore viewed as a different time. The Gemara continues to cite Rochizda's statement. However, if meat of a slaughtered animal became mingled with a larger quantity of pieces of animal carcass, the meat of the slaughtered animal is not nullified by the carcass, as is possible for a carcass to attain the status of a slaughtered animal. This means that it can lose its ability to transmit ritual impurity as if a carcass becomes spoiled to the extent that it is no longer edible. It loses its impure status. The fact that the carcass meat has the potential ability to attain the status of slaughtered meat renders the two meats as the same type. And according to Rabbi Yehuda, the smaller amount of slaughtered meat would not be nullified in the larger amount of carcass meat. The entirety of the mixture would not be considered carcass meat, but would retain its status of intermingled carcass and slaughtered meat. Here too, will you say that if the carcass has owners, other than the owner of the slaughtered meat, it is not nullified in the slaughtered meat? And if you say yes, it is indeed so. But isn't it taught? Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri said, Ownerless objects acquire residence for Shabbat in their location, and anyone who finds them on Shabbat may move them. 2,000 cubits in all directions, but not beyond that. As although they have no owner, it is as though they have an owner. This shows that even property has no claimants like salt and water in this Mishnah has its own independent Shabbat limits which do not become nullified when mixed with items that have a different Shabbat limit. Abaye said to Rav Safra, are you comparing a halakha involving prohibitions? For example, ritual law to monetary law? An object subject to a prohibition, such as a prohibited food, can be nullified, whereas one's money cannot be nullified. Therefore, the initial question remains, why isn't the small amount of salt and water in the dough 
which is subject to the ritual restriction of Shabbat limits, nullified in the rest of the dough, in the manner of nullification of all other ritual prohibitions. And what is the reason that the water and salt are not nullified in the dough? By said, it is a decree that the sages made, lest a woman make dough in partnership with her neighbors. Indeed, in the case of the Mishnah, the small amount she received from her neighbor should be nullified in the dough. However, on another location, several friends or neighbors might decide to pool ingredients and prepare bread in partnership, in which case the bread is certainly bound by the Shabbat limits of all the parties combined. In order to prevent confusion between making dough in partnership and making it with borrowed ingredients, the sages made a decree that the dough in both cases be subject to the same limitations. Rava said a different reason. Spices are made in order to add taste to food, and taste is not nullified, even if the amount of actual sustenance is minute. Nullification indicates that a small amount of food may be considered insignificant and therefore null and void, but if an ingredient is added with a specific intent that its taste be noticed, there can be no nullification.